Sing unto the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Open our hearts and our minds, O Lord, we pray, through the ministry of your word, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Many of the psalms in our Old Testament Psalter focus on things like our enemies, with words in them like, deliver us, O Lord. Some of them focus on things like our tribulations, with words like, how long, O Lord. Others on idolatry and false gods, encouraging us to trust in the one true God and him alone. Today's psalm, number 98, as does Psalm 96, which are both very similar, Psalm 98 focuses exclusively on the God of creation, the God of preservation, the God of redemption, the one and only true God. There is no mention in the psalm of our enemies, our tribulations, or of false gods. The psalmist's sole purpose is to praise the victorious God and his marvelous works. Beginning with the words, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Now, true it is that his praise is upon reflection of God's mighty deliverance most likely in regard to a past, maybe recent past, military victory for Israel. For he, in verse 1, he states, His right hand, his holy arm, have worked salvation for him. <clears throat> but again, his purpose in this psalm is all about praise and thanksgiving, regardless of the particulars of his deliverance. And it is, I believe, appropriate for us Christians to apply this mention of victory to the spiritual victories we know, to our daily personal spiritual victories that God is pleased to give us, but also not to ignore the cosmic dimensions of God's redemptive plan. It is right and good for us to at all times give thanks to God for the redemption by Jesus Christ on the cross. This thing that God is up to, salvation history as it is unfolded in the Bible, God so loved he gave, this thing is huge. It is monumental. And Paul in Ephesians 6 gives us a sense of its magnitude. We saw this in our Sunday school today where he writes, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. What God is up to, Paul is saying, is big. And in Colossians, Paul assures us by writing, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. Those are all set by God. This he set aside, <laughs> nailing it to the cross. And what happened there? He disarmed, he says in Colossians verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. 
So the psalmist too here in number 98 is focusing on this cosmic scene of salvation. And so he calls upon us, and in fact all of creation, to praise and thank God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth, he writes. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. He says, let the rivers clap their hands and let the hills sing for joy together. You see, all of creation now is waiting in hopeful anticipation for that final day of redemption. Because as Paul writes in Romans 8, the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For it too, as he writes in verse 20, it too, the whole creation was subjected to futility. While we see what we see all throughout natural creation when it goes awry, all because of the sin of man. And so, as one writer puts it, when the Lord returns on the last day, all effects of sin will be gone. And the creation realm, too, will enjoy the new heavens and the new earth, as Peter puts it. And for us... As Christians, as we read earlier in Ephesians and Colossians, the enemy of sin and death has been destroyed. <clears throat> Our sins are forgiven in him, and we will live happily with the Lord forever. So, the psalmist says, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Things. The Lord has made known his salvation, he writes. He has remembered his steadfast love and his faithfulness. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Break forth, he says, into joyous song, singing praises. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Because, as he concludes in verse 9, when he comes to judge the earth and all its peoples, his judgment will be according to truth and equity. In other words, all things will be set right according to his righteousness when he returns. And Jesus says the same thing as you heard read in our gospel text. In that text, he foretells in the 30s of the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple, which would happen in 70. His message is, broader than that, that in this life and in this age, it's hard. And it's often discouraging. And at the same time, it is alluring. And so when you look at the temple, he said to them, don't be so impressed with its splendor, or if you're having trouble, don't be so downhearted by the trouble that you lose sight of the eternal, the hope. Because one day, Jesus will return. The entire New Testament, and later in this gospel passage that we heard part of it read this morning, in, in verse 25 later on, Jesus says that as his return gets closer, and we don't know when that is, so you know we shouldn't spend too much time trying to figure it out. Many, many do, but they're all wrong. <laughs> None of us know. But as it nears, Jesus says. Signs of his coming will become more prevalent. And things are going to get weird. In the skies and on the earth and even in our hearts. It's 
it will be very, very puzzling. But he says, these things portend his coming. And so he reminds his disciples, and it is a nice tune. <laughs> it's okay. It's heavenly and it, it's kind of heavenly in its own, its own way. These signs are coming and they will increase whenever that time is. And they portend his coming. And, and in that he reminds his disciples later in this gospel text don't panic don't run like what was the chicken's name chicken little, chicken little. Chicken little. <laughs> don't, you know sky may be falling but we don't have to we don't have to panic in fact he says what don't panic, but, and you don't have this text because it's further in the text, but he says, look up. <laughs> Raise your heads. Why? Because your redemption draweth nigh. That's our hope. Look up. It's with anticipation that we look up, knowing that Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. One day, God will bring his entire salvation history to its consummation. And that big thing will be fulfilled. And the good news is, you and I are part of what is being redeemed. Look up, your redemption draweth near. You are part of that by your faith in Jesus. My first aluminum tennis racket, before that they were hard, you know, just wooden. My first aluminum one, one that I had my eyes set on for a long time, was purchased with s and green stamps. <laughs> Remember those? Yeah. Mom would shop wherever, and then after you shop, you'd get this column of stamps and you take them home and you paste them in this little cardboard booklet and, and, and eventually uh, I had enough or she did but she was doing it for me had enough stamps to go and get this tennis racket we had met the redemption price so we were able to take this thing home. It was a redemption. It was a buying back. You see, that's what our salvation is. That's it. Lift up your head for your redemption draweth nigh. Christ paid the price through his life and his death. His death was an atonement. It was a, an at one month. You can pronounce it atonement, at one month. He brought us into reconciliation with God because of what he did. And it redeemed us. He paid the price for sin. As I've said many times, the Christian life is an eschatological experience. It is an already and not yet reality. Christ already accomplished our salvation. <clears throat> Nothing more can be added. But our experience of it <clears throat> is not yet consummated. It will be consummated at his coming. Then and there, <clears throat> the very cosmos will be renewed and all of his disciples will experience renewal and a bodily resurrection. We get new bodies. There will be no more sadness, no more sorrow, no more sickness, sin, or death. Only joy forever. And the, the psalmist reminds us that this is why the rivers are climbing their hands. 
and why the hills are singing for joy because the entire creation, because of sin, is groaning with anticipation for this day. And we too, therefore, are to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And this is the context in which stewardship happens. This is the context in which our giving happens. Because of the Lord's grace and His goodness, we give. We give our time. We give our talents. We give our treasure. <clears throat> All in service to the Lord. You see, a steward owns nothing. A steward manages everything that his master gives him. At the offertory each Sunday, we say, All things come from thee, O Lord. And of thine own, we have given thee. And we give because we're happy to. Paul in 2 Corinthians 9 writes, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. <clears throat> For God loves a cheerful giver. God is glorified when his people give of their time, their talents, and their treasures <clears throat> to others. He doesn't need them, but you give them to others. Because this giving is a reflection of his image in us. God loves, and what does he do? He gives. God so loved, he gave. And by his grace shown to us now, we too love. We love him supremely, and we love others as he has commanded us. As one Protestant Reformation statement of faith concludes regarding this, truly good works should be done willingly or from a voluntary spirit by those whom God's Son has made free. It is all a part of making a joyful noise.